Oh, I, I, I'll give you a fairly fast rundown of my life because I'm a very, I've been extremely happy with my life. At age 11, I discovered uh, a poster that advertised uh, a future for disadvantaged kids. I was a, a eighth child in a family of nine, and. Um, my father died when I was six months old. Oh. Anyhow, I, in the opportunities were to go to Australia, I thought, I already had a sister in Australia, an oldest sister in Australia. Where were you but living at the time? I was living uh, in um, Newcastle, okay. England. Okay. I'd moved around a lot as a little kid. My father died when I was uh, six months old. Anyhow, cut a long story short, I was not quite 11 years of age. I convinced my mother that uh, she should let me go. <coughs> I became a ward of the Fairbridge uh, Society. And my luck was that in 1937, at age 11, I just turned 11, I boarded a ship in Liverpool and came to Canada. Okay. And it was a wondrous four day journey across the country. Yeah. If, at the time, all the harvest was being brought in, it was September 1937, all the harvest was being brought in and it was all being done with horse-drawn equipment at the time, but I now realize that that probably was money saving because they couldn't afford the gasoline. Remember the, the dust storms and the depression? That, that time. So that what what time. part of the country are you in at this point? At this point? I'm traveling across Canada okay. to Vancouver Island. Okay. Okay. So I ended up in Vancouver Island at a Fairbridge Farm School. And I just I just turned eleven. I had a sister and a niece with me. My sister was two years older, and my niece was only six years of age. Wow. I was at that school for four years trained uh, as a general farmhand and um, but although I escaped a couple of times uh, I really liked the place and they were very good to me so four, four years later at age 15 I went off to Victoria to my first job on a little dairy farm I was replacing a guy that had just joined up. Okay. A, 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 a school chum a year or two older than me. Um, <clears throat> within a year and a half, I'd, I'd worked in a factory uh, and I ended up in a cattle ranch in the Caribou. I'd already attempted to join the army at age when I was 16, lying about my age. And so as soon as uh, my birth, 17th birthday approached, I left the car, sort of quick caribou, and went to Vancouver and joined up. And I wisely kept to my lying of only one year increase because I subsequently discovered that in fact they had a record on me. <laughs> 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 Which explained why I ended up with a, a regimental number. So I thought you had to be 18. You could. No, you, you, you could walk into the army depots and tell them anything and they'd take you. But at that point in time, I guess when I was 16, they had a surfeit of young guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> after a day or two, they kind of eased me out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so uh, I was assigned Armored Corps and I went to Brampton, a beautiful little town at the time. And took our uh, took basic training, and then uh, we advanced to Camp Borden, and Camp Borden had three Armored Corps training regiments then, and I trained as a Armored Corps uh, driver maintenance for Armored regiments have a huge requirement for trucks and things like that to sub keep them supplied. Yeah. Um, so, 
but I'm only I'm only still only 17, preparing to be 18. They won't send you overseas until you're 19. Okay. So I'm in trained soldier regiment in Camp Borden, doing a lot of things like drill competitions, uh, playing the enemy for young lieutenants going from the second to the uh, first lieutenant, uh, the second lieutenant to, to full lieutenant uh, in the tank corps. Okay. Um, and then magically, when my uh, 18th birthday approach, and I'm now allegedly 19. I'm promoted rank and corporal. I take 50 guys under my command and see that they rise and shine and do all the things they hated me because I was so young. <laughs> I got it then. First, uh, I didn't get seasick going overseas. They all did. I had to see that the washrooms were cleaned. I bloody well assigned half a dozen, locked the doors and made sure that we got them cleaned, <laughs> even though the sick guys were banging on the door outside. It was horrendous, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I was fortunate I didn't get sick. And um, we go to a nice uh, town in England called Woking, and I'm in the Armoured Corps Reinforcement Centre. And... Uh, I get a pass and go off and see my mother. I hadn't seen her for seven years. Wow. Here's a laugh. Uh, typical teenager. I, I discovered uh, after uh, the, there was a party at some place, some seashore place. Uh, I take a bus and I go to Tynemouth, and it's blackout and foggy. I get off the bus and I can see two women standing against a brick wall. And... Uh, I inquire of them how I how can I get to this party? And one turned to the other and said, It's a goddamn yank. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I started laughing. I said, You know how like, here I am, seven months uh, away from the country and they think I'm a yank. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I went on my way, found the party and had a good time and then eventually went home. When I got back to uh, my base, uh, I discovered that uh, my acting rank had expired, and I was now charged with being AWOL, and I didn't defend myself, oh. although I had a pass, you know. Yeah. But I won't explain that away. I just took took whatever was coming, and then the entire draft was reassigned to infantry. Now we're talking about uh, probably October 44. Okay. Casualties in the infantry were heavy. So they needed more infantry, not armored corps guys. Yes. Yeah. So I off I go to uh, Aldershot for infantry training. And then let's hurry up and wait. We finish our training and we're in these bloody British barracks, which were austere. And then the next time, it was shortly after uh, New Year's 1944, we were on a train to Scotland and on a, on a, a boat to Italy, escorted by a bunch of destroyers. Okay. Um, we made it safely and uh, landed at Naples, probably late January 45. And uh, as we got off the boat, we were met by all kinds of hungry kids and the barrels of cans of hot something or the other, and they were handing it to us as we were going to proceed the 30 miles or sort of the reinforcement center. We all gave them to the kids. Yeah. You know, and got on whatever this was, an interurban inter uh, train or streetcar. We ended up, I ended up in a place called Avellino. And uh, we assembled on a parade square and Sergeant Major said, guys from the west over here, guys from the east over here. 
Well, I guess Manitoba was a dividing spot. <laughs> so I, I went over to the west side and there were all kinds of markers for various regiments in the first division. And I saw the Seaforth marker and fell in on it. Oh. And it was oversubscribed. Okay. The sergeant major took half the number and wheeled them off and made them PPCLI. <laughs> you know, so um, so I'm now a reinforcement for the uh, first division se- second infantry brigade, the Seaforth Hounders. Okay. Okay. And I didn't know it at the time, but. Uh, They'd already decided to remove the Canadians from from Italy. They, the Canadians had been in Italy since July '43. Had done remarkably well uh, in the first several months, and by December '43, they were facing that opposition in Ortona. That took I've read that stuff. I, I mean, thank God I wasn't there. I mean how they played the infantry sections in, into that action and resp- and how the Germans were so well defended. Yeah. Uh, it was incredible. Yeah. yeah. Hellish, a lot of guts. Uh, we lost 6,000 guy, uh, 6, guys in Italy. So what was going on is they were about to remove the entire Canadian force from Italy to Northwest Europe. They wanted the first Canadian army to be fully composed and have the extra strength because we're about to go on to a, a final push in the Netherlands campaign. So, uh, before I know it, I'm in a rainfor- uh, we're in a transit camp uh, near that volcano outside of Naples. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then on an American troop ship and into Marseilles and a long train journey into uh, through France into uh, in boxcars yeah in, into uh, northern, northern Holland in uh, northern Belgium actually and uh, I then joined the regiment there And my first meal in that regiment, uh, where we arrived late at night, was being ushered into the schoolroom where they had what we call Dixie uh, burners going. And it was filled with meat and vegetable stuff. And you take off the lid and it made you sick. <laughs> <laughs> so we opted for drinking beer instead. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, um, Pretty soon, uh, we we did some uh, weapon zeroing and stuff, and I uh, did pretty well on the Bren gun, you know. So I'm in a section now, uh, a B-12 uh, uh, platoon of B Company of the C-4000 there. And a long journey uh, into uh, through northern Belgium, into Germany, crossed the River Rhine on a floating bridge. Okay. The cities on each side of that bridge were absolutely demolished. Ended up in the Reichswald Forest, which had been part of the German defense system. And there'd been fierce battles in there. There were little enclosures of graves and people who had lost their lives in that. And after a little while, we then pushed off and were into the Holland and the objective was to cross a river in the spring now yeah. and the river's in full flood and it's the operation is cannon shot which was to push the Germans out of the seas Zutphen, uh, Appledorn and various other places and force the Germans out of Holland. Um, and so I was in the first wave uh, that went on that and for our battalion and the 
the Peavy's and I uh, had a company to the right of us. We crossed the river in a thing called Lord of Buffaloes, which held about a platoon of infantry that had a ramp on the back. They were operated by Brits. Okay. Uh, a gun turret on the front. And to my surprise, we were in that thing for about two hours before we actually hit the other bank. Yeah. Pissing on our helmets and throwing it over the side, you know. Uh, and it was made by the Chicago Tin Can Company. I laughed like hell when I saw that sign. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand. You know? But anyhow, it got us across the river. We scrambled over the front of it, and while this uh, turret machine gun is keeping the enemy at bay, we run like hell and dig in. It was flawless. We did what we were told. 700 feet in, dig in. Another company comes through. It, it went magically. I thought it was a piece of cake. Uh, but you know, when I went back uh, some years later and went into the Horton Cemetery, yeah, we lost 28 dead. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. But just think about it. Uh, you go backtrack to to Italy. Uh, our troops. About 100,000 Canadians were in Italy uh, during the campaign there. Uh, initially it was 1st Division and then that was enhanced to, uh, with an armor brigade and then it was enhanced to a, a corps and uh, the 5th Division, armored division was in there. And um, so about 100,000 Canadians served in Italy and we left 6,000 dead there. That's staggering when you think about it. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, I don't know how that compares with Europe, but I was, I was shocked when I went back to Holland and discovered that um, we had had 28 fatal casualties and many others that were wounded. You know? yeah. One of my uh, school friends who, after, after I dug in, after I crossed that river, uh, another company goes through and clears a German house that had been causing some problems. And he comes back with prisoners. The son of a bitch recognizes me. <laughs> I didn't even know he was in the regiment. <laughs> you know, That's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of days later, uh, as we progress on, he gets uh, wounded and he leaves the regiment. You know, I know this from looking at yeah. records. But, but that's, that's how things were. Uh, the interesting thing is that you never really thought about the guys that uh, were taken away for medical reasons, wounded or whatever, or the guys that uh, got killed. Yeah. You just moved on. You forgot about it. That used to distress me when I watched that Afghan stuff and there's rump ceremonies. Yeah. But that's another story. Um, so, uh, that cannon shot went extremely well. And uh, within a month, uh, we were in. Amst we were the f the Sea Force for the first battalion to am enter Amsterdam, and uh, responsibility was securing securing the city and uh, getting the Germans uh, by agreement to go to the, the places where they would be locked up, and get all their get them to turn in their weapons and stuff. And so I ended up on a thing called the Eclipse Dump commanded by the uh, 2IC of my company, B Company, uh, then a Captain Fairweather. <laughs> and he probably doesn't remember me, would never have remembered me, except I was a, probably the only red-headed guy in, in his, in his, under his command. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, German convoys would come in. We were in a place called the Colonial Museum, a lot of low buildings and a big uh, magnificent structure which had been used by the Germans as a headquarters or something. The murals all over the place in it. So we lived in there initially while we were doing this collection. Convoys would come in and we'd take all these weapons and stuff and get rid of them and, uh, and then we'd get them back to where they came from and keep the, the vehicles. Yeah, uh, one of the vehicles we kept was the American Dusen Half, which the Germans had ca captured. Okay. And as part of that eclipse dump, I was sent off to these this barracks to to clean, which the Germans had been occupying. 
and you fill that truck with things called Panzerfausts. What's it? Kind of a German rocket launcher thing to kill okay. tanks. Okay. I had that truck full of Panzerfausts, and I was instructed to deliver it someplace, and I can't remember where, but I wasn't familiar with a deuce and a half, you know. Quite different from the vehicles that I've been trained in. Yeah. But anyhow, I drove through Amsterdam and delivered this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think on the way I had a bit of a problem and I gave some Dutchman who helped me the entire toolkit for the truck as compensation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, yeah. there were no questions asked, you just did it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, then after a lovely time in uh, Amsterdam, and when I'm in Amsterdam, uh, this guy, Herbie Barassa, what the hell he was doing in the Sea Force, he's from Sudbury. Okay. <laughs> I'm on, on the right, he's on the left. <laughs> That's Herbie Barassa. I've never, I lost contact, contact with him, so I don't know what, whatever happened to him. You know. But anyhow, uh, the regiment was going home, and most, uh, all the old sweats in the Sea Force had been over there for five years. So guys like me didn't count. Yeah. So I then decided I was going to switch to military police. Why? They have motorcycles. <laughs> and when I was a raw recruit in the Armored Corps, they said that I couldn't be a dispatch rider. I ride a motorcycle because I was only had in grade eight, and I was too dumb. That rankled me. So I got even, joined the military police and got myself, I went to one Div Provo company, it used to be an RCMP initially, Okay. and I'm in Apple Dawn without any training, now a military policeman. And then I'm, then we moved to Nijmegen and we're doing all kinds of stuff uh, down there. And when one Div Provo company falls up, they move me to Apple Dawn. And when we arrive in Appledorn, the sergeant major says, can anybody ride? Well, hell, I'd be right can. Okay, so keep going. So I ended up in the traffic section with motorcycles. Long story, uh, cut short. I go out on a routine patrol with a guy that's more experienced and the stupid son of a bitch makes a U-turn in front of me. And it's a Harley Davidson with a, a, a shift, side shift. Okay. When I gear to slow down, it goes into neutral. Oh no. We collide. I get off and apologize, pick my bike, and then I realize I've got a broken collarbone. So for the next 50 days, I'm in a hospital and repat system. I end up going to Bruges, Holland a ferry over to the UK to a Canadian General Hospital in Reading. Okay. And when I emerge from there, they give me a leave. And this is it's now about uh, uh, New Year's 1945. I go to Edinburgh on leave. <laughs> and when I get back, I'm, I'm in the military police reinforcement depot. All run by a bunch of total assholes. Yeah. And we spend endless hours each day doing drill and having our kits inspected. But eventually, I come out of there, uh, having been robbed of my combat boots and stuff by senior NCOs, and I end up in a sixth company in London, England. Okay. And this is a company that was established. Uh, to close down all the other companies we had throughout England and clean up the detritus from Canadians in England, like guys who had left, who had deserted or in prison, get them out when they, they finish their sentence and put them back in the repat system back to Canada. Yeah. Uh, pick up weapons that some of people had left at the billets and uh, things like that. Uh, I had a whole lot of uh, miscellaneous duties which intrigued me because uh, I had no training whatsoever. 
after I locked out, you know. Yeah. And then we we're down at Southampton loading ships to go back to Canada. Uh, um, I was on duty the day that the former sergeant major of that company I had been with in Appledorn uh, wanted to get off the boat and my instructions were not to let anybody off. So I said to him, no sir, because there's one officer first class. I said, no sir, you can't get off. We argued a bit, but I stood my ground. Yeah. And uh, what I didn't know is he'd had an arrangement with my sergeant who was displeased with me, so I'm back to London. Uh, and they, uh, I'm doing stuff in the backs and doing various things, but I get called to the front office. They want a team to go to France to pick up this prisoner from a, a, a French jail and uh, keep him in custody while he goes on a, um, a court-martial, uh, some officers of evidence in the court-martial. So we travel all over the bloody place of France. This guy's a deserter okay. who joined one of those gangs of allied deserters and were stealing from the supply system and selling it on the black market and having a hell of a good time. Yeah. Uh, and so I escorted Bill Wilding while living in a hotel du Quai Voltaire right opposite the Louvre in Paris. Nice. I used to swim in the Seine because I love swimming. And uh, I do my duty looking after this guy on a 24 hour basis in the British Guard room in the Pig Isle area of France. So if you've been Paris, it was just down the road from uh, Moulin Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, uh, there's, there's, uh, yeah, there's me uh, sitting on, on, on my Jeep uh, outside this uh, Hotel de Quai Voltaire, which is right across the Seine from the Louvre. We lived, we, we, half a dozen Canadians lived on the upper floor of that hotel. The lower part was occupied by a British military police company. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that place across the, across the, the water was a, a uh, the Louvre. I thought it was some kind of a, a college because I used to see young couples coming out to the uh, the uh, the uh, little boulevard on the on the water. Yeah. You know? So um, we went all over all over uh, France uh, interviewing witnesses and. Um, we had a judge advocate with us, so uh, so it was a synopsis. They called it a synopsis of evidence, and then there was a trial in a nice courtroom in uh, in Paris. And this guy who was laid off, uh, he got seven years hard labor. Wow. And um, next thing you know, we're taking him back to England. We dump him into a uh, into the cell for transfer to a place called Henningley, and. Uh, I go off on a bit of leave. When I come back, the front office tells me, hey, you're going back to Canada. First off, you better stop at Henley. Oh, what's that for? Pick up Bill Wilding. And so I take Bill Wilding aboard this ship and I spend my, with you know, a couple of, uh, part of the team. And I've got a pretty good relationship with Bill. Yeah. Because I told him at one point when I took him down for a shower, with a bunch of Brits has helped me escort him. I said, if you make one move, Bill, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> I probably would have. Yeah, we are. God, thank Christ you didn't make any move because I'd have been in real trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, um, he, uh, I took him to the side of the ship and handed him over to an MP launch, and they took him to McNabb's Island, which was a military prison. Where is that? in Halifax Harbor. Oh, okay. And I waved goodbye to Bill because I liked the guy. Yeah. And we would got along well. And um, I got on the train and f four or five days later I'm in Vancouver. I go to the depot and insist that they release me as soon as possible. And I go out and find myself a job. Doing? Labor. I became a carpenter's helper 
guess what? That translated into moving concrete blocks endlessly within a small construction site, helping the plasterers, uh, the masons, put them together. Yeah. Working weekends with these guys. I'd, I'd get home from that, that work totally exhausted. Oh, I guess. And I was living in a rooming house near Stanley, uh, just outside of Stanley Park. Do you know Stanley Park? Mm -hmm. Lost Lagoon. <laughs> Okay. There was a big house there and a whole bunch of us, all ex-military, some women also. I'd come home from this labor and they'd have a strip poker game going. I'm entirely inept at cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you know. Anyhow, I did connect with a, my old school friend who had been my best pal since 1937. Yeah. He'd been in the Merchant Navy. We connected. I had learned that if I got my education up to university entrance, I could go to university on DBA. So the two of us en enrolled at a cram school in downtown Vancouver in sort of November 46. In April 45, we, uh, 47, we wrote the exams. And we parted. Yeah. And he went off someplace and I went up to the Okanagan and magically when my results arrived I made it into university. So I spent four years at university. Had a probably the best four years of my life. Yeah. Initially I disdained those stupid Greek societies, but I met a couple of guys I liked. They talked me then joining the Delta Youth Saban fraternity. I keep became the party. Then he rented a really big house uh, to have a fraternity house. So I, I got loyal. I went and lived in that house. And I was the party chairman. But we got stuck with cleaning up the bloody house after this weekend party. So when I knew it was going to affect my grades, I moved out. Yeah. But by that time, I'd met the gal I was eventually going to marry. And I moved out to my old boarding house, which was a closer distance to her. And that worked magically. And uh, when I was in sewage scene by this time, during the summers, and the first two summers I did in Calgary as infantry, then I opted to go to the Provost Corps School in Camp Borden okay. in 1950. And the um, Korean War breaks out and they want me to come back in to the military as a commission officer. Yeah. I declined and I said I'm going to finish my degree and then they offered a better program. They put me on salary and give me a commission uh, as a second lieutenant. Okay. And so I took that and I was now getting like $90 a month instead of the DVA 60 to live on. And uh, when I graduated, I went to Prairie Command Prover Company. I was there for a while. Uh, they shipped me all over the place. I became the area Prover Marshal for Saskatchewan. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then I'm in a place called Dundurn getting set up for summer training for a militia. And I got an email and it says, you're going to Korea. Yeah. So, I'm in Korea by 1952, July 52, I'm in Korea. Yeah. Wow. But after six months there, they transferred me out and I go to Tokyo. And I'm the Commonwealth Detachment Commander in Tokyo and uh, Area Provost Marshal for all Commonwealth soldiers there. And the base, the base in uh, Tokyo is basically a leave center for Commonwealth troops. It was a former naval uh, research station. Okay. Had weight machines and a big pool for testing hulls. And it was nicely located. Uh, staffed originally by Australians. Uh, the base commander was an Australian, but with a mixed bunch of us there, Brits and stuff. Yeah. And I was there for six months doing that. Uh, deal. By this time, the Japs had got their 
their sovereignty. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, you couldn't. Uh, they could. They could seize uh, Commonwealth troops who had done misdemeanors or whatever under Japanese law and hold them for a number of days. And my objective was to get them back into our control. So I spent a lot of time in Japanese precincts uh, talking to the chiefs and uh, with an interpreter and basically getting get, get control of the guy. I usually did. I was successful. Good. Yeah. And then I'm back in Canada and made my bride of one year because I married her before I left. Okay. Smartest thing I ever did. 